Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we return to Order of Battle Pacific. Uh, this is the second battle within our attack on Midway. Um, I've lost count of how many battles into the actual World War II campaign we are, but it is the second battle, uh, or second video that I've made here with the Battle of Midway that's underway. Um, thus far, our troop transports in the south are kind of trying to maneuver to avoid some American cruisers, which showed up to the south of Midway. Uh, meanwhile, our force in the northwest of the map is moving directly east to attempt to find and destroy the American carrier fleet. We've run into some destroyers. We've, we've also detected, I want to say, a cruiser or two. Maybe those are the southern force. Um, so we're certainly scouting the forces out, but we haven't yet detected the American carriers. Uh, the Americans have launched a large dive bomber, it appears, attack. I didn't see any torpedo bombers. There may have been a few uh, against our carrier force and our fighters are presently engaging to uh, intercept that. Uh, actually, I'm trying to think. Did we already successfully destroy them all? Um, looks like there's some American fighters that are attacking our recon planes here at this point. Um, and yeah, actually, I'm sorry. Uh, we, we destroyed the bulk of the enemy carrier force. It looks like there's at least one more dive bomber. Uh, they did get a little bit of damage in on one of our carriers, but uh, nothing too substantial. And I will say one thing, you know, this type of game is interesting. I think sort of the cat and mouse nature of the game can be really fun uh, for naval operations uh, because really on a big map uh, sometimes it can be difficult to detect where the enemy is located. I think it would be better for like multiplayer if you were playing in a random map with random ship locations and your goal was to you know, track down and destroy the enemy fleet. Uh, but it's not quite as effective in a historical battle because if you've read your history uh, or if you just look up online, you can pretty much always find where the American fleet starts out. Um, and there you go. We detected the enemy carrier fleet now as well. Um, so that's good. Uh, we can now direct our bombers in and uh, attempt to wipe out the American fleet uh, and win the Battle of Midway. Um... But there's a couple of shortcomings of this, this type of game. I enjoy it a lot, obviously. I've been playing it quite a bit, um, and I've been talking about it quite a bit. In the last video, I talked more about uh, Pacific Crucible, the first of a, I believe, trilogy of books. Two are out, the third is uh, in production, uh, that look at the Pacific War, uh, mainly from the American side. Um, the book does a pretty good job of telling the history of the rise of Japan's militarist state, which, to be honest, you know, as someone who's read a lot of history and knows the general tenor of the Pacific War and a lot of the details as well, uh, the book does a great job of kind of giving you a overview of uh, the changing political landscape and how Japan went from being allied to the British in the early 1900s all the way to war with the British uh, in 1940, and that's after having fought on the American and the British side during World War I. But one area does seem to fall behind outside of the Battle of Midway and Coral Seas. It doesn't seem to tell the story of the Japanese during the war very well. It seems to focus very heavily on the Americans, which is understandable. American source material is easier for a Western writer to digest. Um, but it, it ignores a lot of the key successes of the Japanese, or maybe downplays them, or um, maybe it's just they weren't that <laughs> impressive, I'm not sure, um, before Coral Sea and before Midway. But... Um, trying to remember where I was going. Oh yeah, one of the key benefits of this game, uh, in my book, is that it does a very good job of simulating the hide-and-seek nature of carrier combat during World War II. More specifically, carrier combat during uh, the early part of World War II. Once the Americans got an overwhelming uh, numerical advantage, you know, after mid... or not after Midway, but after the Guadalcanal campaign, things changed a bit. But all the way through the Guadalcanal campaign with, you know, the Battle of Santa Cruz Islands, uh, when the Americans were fighting the remaining Japanese fleet, um, after that time period, things changed. But before that, it was very hide-and-seek. You know, the side that found the enemy first generally did very well, and to the Americans' fortune, they tended to find the Japanese first. The Americans also benefited, and the book does a good job of talking about this, from far superior radios. So often when the Americans would detect a Japanese fleet, they immediately were able to radio back to their fleet. However, the Japanese, while they had radios in their aircraft, they were not nearly of the same quality as the Americans. So the Japanese sometimes, and this actually happened at Midway, would detect the American fleet 
and then they would send a message off, and sometimes that message would never reach the uh, Japanese ships, so they couldn't launch air raids because they didn't know where the heck uh, the Americans were because their, their recon planes often had to return uh, from their flight before they could provide accurate information because these radios were, you know, had, had problems. And this was actually a common problem that the Japanese had to deal with. The other big problem that the Japanese had to deal with was radar. The American ships had radar. Uh, the Japanese ships did not. The Japanese were about a year behind when it came to radar. Um, so, especially during Midway uh, and Coral Sea, the Americans were able to get their combat air patrol aircraft up into the air and ready to intercept uh, incoming Japanese attacks and route them in on the attackers. Uh, the Japanese did not have that, and that was a really key thing that I think is under discussed in the Battle of Midway is that the Japanese were really relying on spotters, uh, just, you know, sailors at the anti-aircraft batteries kind of waiting and looking. And there were a couple of key disadvantages. Obviously, not being able to set your aircraft up to ambush the enemy, you know, 30, 40 miles out from the carrier fleet uh, is a, a disadvantage. Uh, not being able to accurately and, and um, effectively organize your combat air patrol against a specific incoming target is obviously a disadvantage. But another disadvantage uh, that that's intrinsic in that uh, limitation is that uh, you don't spot the enemy until they're literally right on top of you. And that actually happened a couple of times. Um, see, the Japanese were lulled down to low altitude at the Battle of Midway to deal with American torpedo bombers because they would come in at low altitude. But then when the American dive bombers came in after that, they were caught flat-footed. They were thousands of feet below the attacking aircraft, and they needed to climb all the way back up. And because they lacked radar, they didn't know that these aircraft were incoming. They didn't know that they were caught out of position. The Japanese didn't have the ability to redirect them up to regain altitude. Um, the... Also, uh, the anti-aircraft gunners didn't know they were coming, and uh, sort of, if you watch the movie Midway, it actually sort of depicts this. In many ways, the Japanese were under attack, the American dive bombers are already tilting over into their steep dives when they were first spotted. So, you've already got an aircraft coming in on its terminal approach, you know, into its final, you know, minute or so dive, and there's no way you're going to respond to that, and your anti-aircraft guns aren't going to be able to get a effective flak fire put up on such short notice. So again, that's another big limitation uh, because of, of the lack of radar. Um, so, the game... Interestingly enough, this game does a very good job with the sort of reconnaissance element and trying to feel out where your enemy is and find them. And I think that would be a very nice uh, feature uh, for a multiplayer game, which maybe I'll go ahead and play someone with, with a multiplayer game. Um, I think it would have to be a randomized map and a random battle, though, because, again, if you have the historical battles, it's just too easy to know where people are, um, even with a quick Wikipedia search. But one area it does struggle in is the technological advantage that the Americans had. You know, you don't have an ability to accurately recreate a fight if the Japanese don't have the radar limitation, or more accurately, if the Americans don't have the radar advantage. Um, and I can't say I played the game a ton from the American side, so maybe these ships have radar that allows them to see further, but my guess is it's just a couple extra hexes. It's not, you know, it's not nearly as decisive as it, as it historically was. Which is all fine and good, I mean... I guess I'm harping on some elements of wanting the game to be more historically accurate when, uh, to be fair, you know, this is a turn-based game um, with kind of puzzle-like uh, level design um, in the Panzer Corps, for, you know, Panzer Corps or Panzer General vein, and it's certainly not the most accurate game, and it's not intending to be, but um, that is one aspect where I feel like they really got the search, um, you know, the attempt to search and find the enemy, that sort of mouse hunt way of trying to, to fight carrier battles. I thought they did a really good job with that. There were just some certain other elements which maybe, I don't know if they could easily be redone uh, to kind of factor in with the limitations of radar uh, or the limitations of the Japanese radios. Um, but if they could, that'd be really neat. Uh, anyway, you can see here our fighter aircraft are uh, dealing the American fighters uh, a severe blow. Uh, the enemy dive bombers are already shot down, so now at this point it's just on our planes to come in and you know, hopefully destroy the American carriers without too much loss. One thing that I am going to need to deal with uh, is these American cruisers, uh, which have pretty effective anti-aircraft fire. I will say that uh, the Japanese ships actually, when the Americans were attacking me, I found 
that the Japanese carriers and the Japanese battleships actually pretty good anti-aircraft fire in this game as well. Um, that is another area where the Japanese were really uh, limited later in the war. I don't think it was really the case at Midway. But the Americans had proximity fuses on their anti-aircraft guns that actually really, initially I don't think at the beginning of the war they had them, or if they did they were very poor. Uh, so basically you had to shoot and get a skin-to-skin -skin kill, which a skin-to-skin -skin kill means as I, I'm torpedoing the American air defense to get rid of it so then I can finish off the carriers at ease. But a skin-to-skin -skin kill basically means the shell literally impacts the incoming aircraft. And a lot of people probably think, okay, that's probably the best way to shoot something down. You shoot it basically like you shoot a bullet at someone, try and hit them. You shoot a bullet up at a plane and you try and hit it. But in World War II, the Americans actually developed an excellent uh, anti-aircraft weapon that was built by a proximity fuse. So when it got to within a certain range of an enemy target, or it may have actually been altitude set as well, which, again, another reason that that anti that radar would be really important is you could set your fuses to detonate at a certain altitude, and your radar would tell you what that altitude was. You didn't have to some have someone estimate it. But basically, when it got to this predetermined point, it would detonate, or when it got to a proximity, it would detonate. And as a result, uh, these excellent proximity fuses made the later war kamikaze attacks very costly. If the Americans didn't have such great proximity fuses in their any aircraft shells, um, you know, it's very possible that uh, the kamikazes that the Japanese unleashed later in the war would have been far more decisive. Furthermore, if the Japanese had the same quality of proximity fuses as the Americans did, then they would have, um, you know, undoubtedly inflicted greater losses on the Americans when uh, the battles happened, you know, around Leyte Gulf or any of the other carrier engagements where the American f carrier aircraft did a very good job of, uh, you know, they, they lo certainly lost aircraft, but nowhere near to the same extent. I mean, you don't see tons and tons of uh, American planes getting shot down at the Battle of Midway or any other later battle by Japanese flak. Uh, not to the extent that the Japanese had wholesale air divisions wiped out uh, by American flak. And some of that has to do with the inexperience of the Japanese aircraft by the time you get uh, around to um, the kamikaze time period where they're just not trained to evade flak as well. But still, a lot of that has to do with the technological superi superiority that the Americans had. Um, but one... Uh, avenue that the Japanese had a big advantage was in terms of in terms of technology was the long lance torpedo uh, which was an, a superb uh, torpedo which could be launched from Japanese submarines or Japanese surface vessels basically and had a very long range very fast and uh, very reliable and a, a massive warhead on it that was far superior to anything the Americans had and um, was a big factor in the Japanese winning several of the early surface engagements during the war, during the Guadalcanal campaign, uh, most notably the Battle of Savo Island. Uh, but we'll we'll talk about that uh, another time. You know, if we end up having a, a Battle of Guadalcanal, then I'll talk about it then. Uh, if we don't have a Battle of Guadalcanal, then, well, I'm sure I'll talk about it at some other point. Uh, but anyway, here, as you can see, we've uh, destroyed two American heavy cruisers, and there's two more heavy cruisers uh, that we have to deal with. We've also got some dive bombers that have put a little bit of damage on one of the American uh, carriers, fleet carriers. It looks like, for whatever reason, they started at a strength of eight. The entire American fleet did. Not sure if that's supposed to represent the sort of inferior quality of the uh, Americans in terms of experience. You know, at this point in the war, the Japanese had far more combat experience than their American counterparts. Uh, so perhaps that's what it's supposed to represent. Um, I find that kind of interesting, though, because the Americans, again, we mentioned it in the last video, but the Americans had far superior damage control, and their ships were all around in much better condition. You know, by the time the Battle of the Midway occurs, uh, the the Japanese fleet, uh, that is, sorry, again, by the Battle of Midway, the Japanese fleet was in very poor shape. Uh, the Americans had been using their fleet pretty actively, but they'd been taking care of it pretty well, and uh, it was operating at a much lower tempo than the Japanese fleet, specifically the Japanese carriers. Uh, from Pearl Harbor all the way until Midway, the Japanese carriers were basically operating without any rest. Uh, the carrier uh, pilots were at exhaustion, uh, they were constantly in combat operations. They weren't getting pulled out for relief. They weren't getting pulled out for any kind of upgrades to their aircraft or to their warships. Uh, the warships had no downtime, no refit time. Basically from December 7th, 1941, 
All the way until uh, June of 1942, the Japanese fleet was constantly engaged in combat operations. Not just the Battle of Coral Sea, which occurred just before Midway, although the units there didn't partake in the Battle of Midway because of the, the result, um, but from basically the attacks on the Java's, Java, there were a, a large series of air attacks by the Japanese fleet that was conducted against Northern Australia, against Darwin, um, and then also in support of the invasion of the Dutch East Indies, uh, the Japanese carrier fleet uh, also made a uh, inroad into uh, the Indian Ocean as well, um, and had been fighting constantly as well. There was a, an action in the Indian Ocean where I think the Japanese shot down something like 40 Allied aircraft, 40 uh, British Empire aircraft, um, and lost something like six of their own. Um, in the attacks on Darwin, they damaged dozens, if not more, ships and sank those in port as well. So the Japanese carrier fleet had been wreaking havoc, but they basically weren't given any time to rest or recuperate. Maintenance was not getting done in a appropriate manner, and safety precautions uh, were not being fulfilled to the letter, again, because there just wasn't time for proper resting and refits. Uh, there was large amounts of debris, grease, you know, buildup of uh, all these sorts of chemicals or whatnot, just of overuse. You know, if you think if you use equipment constantly and you never clean it, uh, things start to build up, things start to break down, and that also hampers your ability to, uh, you know, do things like fight fires. I, I'm not sure if this was Midway or a different battle, but when the Japanese, you know, went to try and fight some of the fighter, fires that broke out on their ships, uh, the water that came out, you know, the, of the hoses was just, you know, like, it, it rust orange. And, and um, they couldn't keep up a reliable stream because the maintenance just wasn't done adequately. Because, you know, one, you could say it was a victory disease. There's a lot of people out there who say the Japanese became victims of their own hubris. They had never met with anything but success. And as a result, uh, well, Coral Sea is not... Uh, not Obviously success, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, basically, they become victims of their own own success, where they don't even think defeat's possible. They don't even think in terms of damage control. You know, we've never been hit by an enemy bomb. We've been safe the entire time. Our cap will keep us safe. We don't need to worry about how we deal with damage control or fires or, you know, any potential damage to the ship. Um, and this all sort of creates this perfect storm that when the Americans do break through the Japanese cap and they do drop several thousand pound bombs, you know, they probably were doomed anyway because of all the fuel and armaments that were below deck that were hit and, and set off in secondary explosions. But they certainly didn't help themselves in any way. Um, the Americans were constantly under heavy attack and constantly took damage. And, you know, the Yorktown nearly sunk at Coral Sea, survived, uh, nearly sunk at uh, Midway. Uh, I think it was a submarine that finished Yorktown off and it had actually survived uh, the heavy damage from the carriers. And again, this is a testament to the way the American ships were built, uh, but it's also a testament to the way that the Americans drilled and trained and were, you know, a very advanced in their ability to fight damage, and the Japanese just were not. And I mentioned the Coral Sea as being an obvious setback for the Japanese fleet, but the, the Japanese high seas fleet didn't really view uh, the Coral Sea in the same way that perhaps they should have, that this was perhaps a sign that the Americans were becoming more proficient. And that's because the two Japanese carriers that were detached and fought at Coral Sea, two fleet carriers, there was a, a light carrier as well that was sunk, but the two fleet carriers, even within the Japanese Navy, were kind of viewed as an inferior grouping. They were viewed as sort of the, J, the JV of the Japanese fleet. Uh, the Shokaku and Zuikaku uh, were viewed as these, you know, sister ships with crews that were less experienced, less prestigious, that hadn't had all the same success that the rest of the fleet had. Uh, they didn't always operate with the rest of the fleet. And as a result, you know, they were viewed as being proficient, but as a step down. And so the thought was, if the Americans barely bruise these, you know, these two other fleet carriers and, you know, we still sank an American heavy carrier at, uh, at Coral Sea. Um, sure, we lost a light carrier, but, you know, we still sank a fleet carrier. Um, against these guys, well, then we're just going to, you know, wipe the wipe the sea, or I don't, even, I don't even know what the terminology would be, but basically just roll them over uh, without too much difficulty. And obviously the Japanese were wrong. Um, but it's, it's an interesting battle to read. Uh, I believe there was a book recently that came out. It was called Shattered Sword. 
And the book Shattered Sword was about basically telling the story of the Battle of Midway from the Japanese side. Um, it's a book that's, you know, again, Midway's a fascinating story, but we always hear it told from the American side with the heroic codebreakers saving the day and, you know, the American torpedo bombers getting butchered, but then the dive bombers coming in and catching the Japanese flat-footed and then, you know, setting the pride of the Japanese fleet ablaze and eventually to sink uh, all on the span of five minutes or so. You know, the entire course of the Pacific War changes. But you don't really hear the side of Japan very often. Um, and again, I think, I mentioned this in our last video, we kind of have mythologized uh, Admiral Yamato as this great historical fleet admiral who um, was just sort of this wily fox, almost like an Erwin Rommel type uh, figure uh, who, you know, once he died later in the war, uh, during the Guadalcanal campaign, once he was killed, um, then, uh, or the Solomon's campaign is more accurately, once he was killed, you know, the Japanese lost their, their principal genius and, and they were no match for the Americans. You know, if he had survived, who knows what would have happened. Um, but I question that. You know, I wonder... Would Yamato really have been able to do much? And, you know, by the Solomon's campaign, he'd become incredibly fatalistic. Uh, Midway was really a crushing blow to him. He'd become a national hero, only to suffer significant embarrassment and lose a lot of the prestige that he had gained in, in leading up to uh, Midway. But uh, my point is that Shattered Sword looks at uh, the Battle of Midway from the Japanese side, and uh, I haven't read it, uh, but it's very well regarded, and I think it's something I'll probably look into, because apparently it does a very good job of kind of telling the, telling the story and uh, in a somewhat unobjective manner with a lot of uh, first-hand sources, as you obviously should have. Um, and it's a story that I'm sure most of us have not heard, most of us have not read, um, and it uh, I think it, it'll probably paint, and I know from the reviews anyway, that it paints Midway in a very different light uh, than it otherwise would. It wasn't, you know, it was a miracle, sort of, yes, but um, not necessarily uh, in the same sort of heroic way that we, we think of Midway. You know, there were a lot of other factors other than just the, the generic narrative that we always hear. Um, in addition to that, there's another book that's uh, well recommended, especially in P Pacific Crucible. It references it quite a bit, um, and that is... Uh, and that book is called Samurai, uh, and it's uh, written by a Japanese uh, fighter pilot, one of Japan's leading aces in World War II, Saburu Sakai, and I'm sure I'm butchering his pronunciation of his name, um, who is one of the few principal Japanese aces to survive the war as well. Um, so, I, I don't know why I'm going off about books at this point. Sorry, I'm just kind of rambling at this point. Um, but basically... Um, Lots of interesting books. I'd like to kind of read a few of them, and you know, hopefully they can color some of my uh, discussion of this game as we go on. I am uh, committed. In my last video, I mentioned it. I am committed to finishing the book. I don't know how much of an appetite there is for the series. You know, the views kind of dipped off a bit toward the end of the uh, regular episodes earlier when I when I did it. But again, there's an expansion coming out soon for it, so I figured I'd bring a little bit more attention to it. And frankly, I don't like that I have kind of a uh, tendency to start series up and never finish them. Um, I've done that with a few. I've done that with Buzz Aldrin's Space Program Manager, which I, I intend to revisit at some point as well. Um, I had kind of done it with Commander of the Great War, although I was always sort of kind of keeping it going at a very uh, sort of here and there pace. And maybe that's what this will be, is just kind of a random video here or there. Uh, my goal for 2016, I hadn't really talked about it all that much. I would like to get a, you know, best of 2015 and then, a, you know, most anticipated of 2016 video up. Um, those did really well for me last year, and um, I enjoy them too. I mean, the, the thing for me is, like, when I do those videos, I don't look at it like, what was the best game that came out this year? I look at it more as, like, what games was I playing the most? Uh, and I'll try and avoid putting any games on there for a second consecutive year. Uh, but still, those are those are interesting, interesting videos to make. So I'd like to do two of those. But other than that, I'd like to, you know, try and get back to a normal release schedule here. I'd like to try and, um, you know, I'd like to make videos more regularly. December and January were crazy months for me, where I had just so much going on. Uh, there was a wedding I was involved in, not my own. I'm already married, uh, and then there was, um, you know, the holidays. 
Uh, and then, you know, there was school, final exams, and, um, you know, January and some of that stuff kind of just taking a, a breather. But now that we're into 2016, you know, and several weeks in, I really want to make an effort to, to, to try. My goal is to put out about 15 videos a month. I'm never going to be one of those guys who does a video every single day. But my goal is maybe a video every other day. If not every other day, then every three days. So between 10 to 15 videos a month. Um... And, you know, for that kind of a pace, I, I want to be able to still have sort of the narrative quality uh, that I put together. I would like, I really would like to have better production value, better editing, um, and really make these uh, more educational, at the same time interesting and uh, engaging. And I think you know, having some production value would do that. But at the moment, I don't have a ton of time to learn that kind of stuff, and it would all be self-taught. Um, and work's been pretty busy as well, so... Um, you'll probably see a fair amount of these types of videos. You know, there'll be some first impression videos. Um, I'd like to return to Scourge of War as well. There's a lot of things I'd like to do uh, this year uh, with the channel. Um, last year was another great year for the channel, and maybe I'll have kind of a, a year in review type wrap up video as well um, at some point. But um, all in all, I'm really happy with the way that things are going. And, you know, I'll, I, long story short, I'm going to. Uh, attempt to play this uh, campaign through to the finish, and um, I don't know whether that's a regular release schedule of, you know, two or three of these, not probably not three, but two videos a week with this game, you know, other games mixed in, obviously this isn't going to be my principal let's play, but maybe like one or two videos of this game every week, one or two videos of another game every week, uh, hopefully the um, Operation Glacier series gets going uh, soon, I've just been really... Uh, that series is going to take a lot of time. That's something where I'm going to try, uh, that, that being the Operation Glacier series, I'm going to try and up the production value a bit for that series. Uh, so it's going to take a lot of effort to do that one well, but I'm going to try. Um, and then, um, you know, in addition to that, uh, continuing with Ruable Waves. I mean, like I said, I've been rambling for like three minutes on this. A lot of stuff I want to do. Um... Don't know how effectively I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do my best. Um, uh, yeah. So, as you can see here, we just torpedoed another American carrier. Uh, we sank the first one just a few minutes ago, and we just sank the other two carriers as well. I assume as this torpedo sails in and sinks it, it does. So, the American carrier fleet, uh, we only found three carriers, and they are now all at the bottom of the ocean. So, Midway is victor... Well, not victorious. We still have to take... Uh, the island of Midway, so uh, we've got 17 more turns to do that. We need to move the transports in. We need to try and mop up against the American fleet, and um, you know. But as far as the historical battle, anyway, we didn't lose any carriers of our own, um, and that may be because there's no real sort of critical hit feature in this type of a game. Um, and uh, we sunk all the American carriers. So from that standpoint, Midway is already a victory for us. Um, but anyway, so. Uh, there's going to be one more video in this particular battle, I think. Uh, I'll probably be able to finish the battle off uh, with another 30 minutes or so. I'm just guessing. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but uh, given that the enemy carrier fleet's destroyed now, we just need to land on the island and mop up what's left. So um, hopefully we can do that. Our, our surface fleet is also far superior, so it shouldn't be too hard. It's just sort of a matter of mopping things up and, and gaining some additional experience for doing so. So... Um, with that being said, I think I'm going to cut this video off here, and um, in the next video we'll finish up the Battle of Midway, which I have no doubt will end in a victory. I'm not sure. I haven't played it. I'm playing it as I, as I talk, um, but uh, hopefully it's a victory. I mean, I, unless the Americans have like three carriers just hidden somewhere with a whole bunch of aircraft about to strike us, um, I think we're probably okay. Uh, we did suffer some damage to one of our light carriers there, but nothing too severe. And, um, you know, all in all, uh, this was a, a pretty successful turn. Anyway, guys, I appreciate uh, you tuning in and listening to me ramble. I uh, hope you enjoyed the video. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.